Branding is uh, a component of this, which I want to talk about. I think it's a big, a huge part of the future. Uh, for much of our history, since uh, European settlement, uh, we traded in everything um, with Europe and the United States. Probably 170 years. That's where most of our relationships, most of the investment, um, certainly our meat and, and uh, livestock products, the wool and all the rest, uh, we traded um, with those two continents. Um, for the last 30 years and a bit, uh, of course, it shifted. So now, um, you look at back how much we traded with China, even 10 years ago, it was minuscule. But now in the region, um, eight of our top 10 trading partners are in our backyard, right? Uh, of course, the biggest is China. They're the biggest with about 130, 140 countries around the world, but we're the seventh biggest, so we're not, we're not small with China. It is significant relationship. Um, our surplus is about uh, uh, 70 billion over what we, what we import from China. Um, so, Trump, eat your heart out. Um, but uh, you take the ASEAN countries together, second biggest trading partner of Australia. Then, of course, Japan, right? And then I think it's the United States who are in the Asia-Pacific region. So, um, there's been this unbelievable emergence. And actually, in the case of China and India, it's a re-emergence uh, to where they were for 18 of the last 20 centuries. And that is they were sharing uh, the centre of gravity of economic and, and political uh, power in the globe. And to, in my view, both those countries this century will be back China before India, but I've spent 12 trips to India in the last two and a half years. They are on their way, I'm telling you, back to where they were for 18 of the last 20 centuries. Now we know what happened for the last 200 years, and it's having a significant influence on the way we do business with the region. That humiliation that these once great na nations um, enjoyed, the, the reputation they enjoyed, the humiliation of being uh, invaded and uh, all the rest being governed by um, nations from Europe it has been something that still very much permeates uh, relationships and the trust that was talked about here earlier that's necessary in, in any sort of relationship. So we've had 170 years uh, doing things a certain way. Largely, uh, when I was, uh, uh, well, I've been in and out of agriculture through a lot of my career in different capacities, but um, certainly in most of that time, the debate's always focused on the supply side. We have assumed that we can't influence markets uh, anywhere else in the world and that we can't really influ influence um, the value of our product. Now, I think because of the emergence of these new markets, um, that's changed. We used to dump, dump, but we, we, would, we would do hundreds of thousands of tonnes of, of beef, from the, especially northern beef, into the US. We still sell a lot of that. They get pig fat and put it with it and, and create hamburgers. And, you know, that's what we did as wholesale markets. And now there's very fundamental difference. You're looking, you look in the United States today, um, grain-fed beef uh, is now sorry, grass-fed beef is now sold at a premium uh, to grain-fed beef. Now, the Americans have always preferred grain-fed beef, but because of their, the concern of people about what is, uh, where's it grown, what's in it, what's been sprayed on it, what, what hormones have been given to the cattle, etc., etc., there's now a premium for the first time ever for grass-fed beef in the United States. Historically, one of our big markets, but as you could see from Mark's presentation, um, you know, it's, we're sliding there, and not dramatically, but it's not going to be a growth market. A lot of our traditional markets are not going to be growth markets. And um, if you're in business, you go for growth. You go for where the growth not only is now, but where you anticipate it will be in the foreseeable future. And of course, it's in the region around us. It's in the region around us. And um, uh, we, we, we have to um, accommodate the, the peculiarities of this new market. And one of the things, you take China, uh, for instance. Um, China uh, has got 20% of the world's population. It's got 7% of the world's water. 
and 63% of that water is deeply polluted. Um, some of that pollution will be centuries being corrected because the, the heavy metals are so deeply uh, in, ingrained into the substrata. Um, one, it creates unbelievable opportunities for Australia, who are very good at water management and all the rest, to provide a service over the decades ahead into China to assist them. But it is the underlying reason why Australia is so much in demand in China. It's because people don't trust the, food, the, the fruit and veg and the meat products. The, the fresh produce in China is not trusted virtually by anyone. They don't know what it was grown in, in terms of water quality. They don't know what it was sprayed with. They don't know what it's been washed in. And all of these factors mean that, and they don't trust, they don't trust their fellow countrymen to, uh, to tell the truth often about, about what's in these products. And it's, it's, a, it's a phenomena, it's, it's driving um, uh, organic produce. Look in Australia, double the price. You go to China, Organics sitting up double the, double the premium price of something that they, if they do trust it. You go to America, that's driving that, that grass-fed beef issue. Subconsciously, people are thinking there's more likely to be less chemicals, etc., etc., in grass-fed beef than grain-fed beef. So there is a phenomena going on which is only going to get greater as, as people get um, more income uh, and um, more particular about issues and they worry about their health. China, once you start to um, give people greater incomes or create greater incomes, they've brought 500 million people out of poverty in China, the first thing they want is protein. And that's driven a lot of the phenomena we've seen in recent years. The second thing they want is health. That's just starting. Watch, watch the health space. It's going to just explode up there. But the 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 protein is, is certainly not a finished game. They've still got 300 million people that come out of poverty and they've still got um, 1.4 billion who, uh, who are looking to improve uh, the amount of protein that they get in all sorts of ways. So it's, um, it's an unbelievable market, but if you've got um, 1.4 billion people, um, how do you position your product? I mean. This is the phenomena that, you know, before we could just put it on a, go take the sheep or the cattle to the marketplace and hope that everything will work out all right and, and trust, trust the market to deliver a, a produce. And, but the averaging that was talked about it went on, a, not just on a farm, it went on across the whole industry. And so the good producers were not rewarded in many cases for a premium quality. Now, because people, um, want to know where it's come from, how it's been produced, um, wh what uh, can they trust what's in it. Um, all of this the whole uh, traceability issue, um, because of technology, it's enabling a, a lot more of this. It won't be long before people with their mobile phone in China will be click on a, a piece of a cut, a cut of meat, <coughs> and be able and, and click on a a little dot on the cut of meat, and up will pop um, on their phone a video. Hi, I'm I'm Tom and Mary. We've got a property in Gippsland in Australia. Uh, we've grown this beef. Uh, look behind us, and you can see the rolling countryside and the water. And you'll be able to build a relationship from your mobile phone to a cut of meat. And then they come back looking for that Tom and Marys. <coughs> Uh, this is the sort of technology that's emerging and it's being driven by this uh, traceability, the absolute demand that people want to know that they can trust what they're buying. And Australia has got the advantage. We're seen as clean and green and healthy. And a lot of it is because of what I was saying about, um, uh, you know, the, the absence of pollution. Where our reputation, there's a lot of people saying we've, we've got to have a brand. Well, that's true. I'll, get on, I'll finish on, on some of that. But um, the brand that uh, has emerged in China is the word Australia. You must have the word Australia if you want to get the advantage of the clean and green and healthy uh, nature. But now then, underneath that, you, can, you should and, and will, and many are, trying to establish a further brand where 
Tom and Mary can be identified or a collection of Tom and Marys in a certain district or whatever, however you're shaping up the supply and the demand side of that, uh, of your market. So it's, um, it's a very exciting time because you've got 1.4 billion people. Uh, even for lamb, lamb's hardly hit the radar up there, but I can tell you the sheep meat is going very strongly. They've got a huge Muslim community in the, in the northwest of, uh, of China, but not only that, there's a preference quite a strong flavour preference for lamb in many other parts of the country. Um, so I think we, you know, we'll be sending live lamb and live cattle. I've just been involved in brokering another 300, up to 300,000 head of cattle a year. The Free Trade Agreement allowed this to happen. No one else is allowed to do it from any other country. That's, that's half what we're currently sending to Indonesia. These sorts of scale increases in market opportunities are going to put a floor under all the things you heard here today. And, and just that's just with one country. You look around the region, Indonesia had four million people in the middle class in the turn of this century. They've now got 50 million people in the middle class. Uh, they're jumping out of their skin. Now, less of a market for us, but the same thing's happening in Malaysia. Vietnam, quite a big market already for us in, in lots of... Vietnam signed up to the TPP. I, I, I never failed to be so impressed that a country like Vietnam, 90 million people, um, given their background and their government system and all the rest of it that we all know about, um, how Vietnam kept agreeing to liberalising that TPP's 21st century agreement in so many different ways, breaking all sorts of new ground, but at the, at the heart of it, it is a, a lot of liberalisation, not just on um, trade, but on investment. So you, you're getting countries, and then you've got India, you know, 1.4 billion. Sheep meat in India, I don't think we'll sell a lot of beef, but sheep meat in India uh, has got enormous prospects, and um, they've now got still got 600 million people living on less than $2 a day, but they've got 160 million people now in the middle class. And again, you're getting the China phenomena is starting to really take hold across India. So a lot of it will be the same issues will be there if we can, we're a high cost country. So to sell into these markets, um, we need to aim for the top 1%. If we got if we doubled all of our production of our agricultural produce, including meat, we could not go anywhere near satisfying the top 1% of the Chinese market. We're mad to just be pushing sort of, you know, averaged quality, uh, good, bad and indifferent, into a market like that when we can command that top 1%. We can be in there. That's why steaks, you go into Shanghai and you're paying $360 for a, a beautiful um, Australian steak. Um, it's because it's been segmented. They trust it. It's, it's, it's bring, it's, there is a understanding with those restaurants as to where it's come from. Often those restaurateurs have been brought down to Australia to see the properties. And relationships are being built. Trust is being built. And they go and sell it. They sell that trust and they put a premium on it. We're a high-cost country. We need the high margins that are associated with high costs. And there's 1.4 billion people. So we have to have... The, the proxy for people to um, learn what to buy and when to buy it and how to buy it is brands. You, we've got to put a huge effort into establishing brands and then positioning those brands. Also, I'll finish on this. If you look across, um, uh, if you look, if you look across Asia, um, the the electronic marketing, um, e-commerce, etc. OK, everyone says, well, it's, it's amazing in China, you know, in the space of no time, um, such 30% of so many commodities. They are linking back into bricks and mortar, but they're a phenomena that's only going to grow. Most of those companies now have a very strong position in Malaysia, in uh, Vietnam, in ASEAN countries generally, in Indonesia, of course, in, and they're starting to move into India. I can tell you the platforms that we've all relied on you know, Google for search and Facebook for social. In, a, in a not too many years' time, um, they'll be history. Th these are, the region will dominate. There's, they're not strong in all these other countries. 
the region where the growth is and where the populations are and the young populations are of the world, in our region, our backyard, is dominated by these other platforms. They go together with brands in a big way. They're a way of establishing your brand in a certain market, a very quick and effective way of establishing a, a particular brand. So uh, it's exciting time, but if, you know, everyone else around the world, Germans and all the rest, they're all looking to do a similar thing. One advantage we've got is we're in the same time zone. I've run a company, or the arm of a company from Arkansas, the US, the big data business we had. Uh, well, they, it was a $2 billion a year business. Trying to work across time frames, be up at three o'clock in the morning, three nights a week doing conference calls, uh, trying to travel 28 hours to Conway, Arkansas, um, try and run a business, you know, late at night after you've had a full day over there and you've got 300 people writing code back here. I mean, it just, after five years, it nearly kills you. I ran a business into Asia. You could do it for 40, 50 years. I mean, it's same time zone. Um, the capacity to do um, emails and make phone calls is really because of the same time zone. Overnight travel to anywhere. So if you can sleep on a plane, you're in good shape. I've just got the bell, and um, I'm just there. Thanks very much. <laughs>